thank you very much, uh, Oleg Ichkoki, for being with us today. So Oleg is a professor of economics uh, at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. He is a member of NDER, CPR, and the uh, other economic association. And he is associate editor at the American Economic Review. Oleg uh, received the John Bates Clock Medal, medal in uh, 2022. Uh, he's also a partner of uh, a lot of uh, association and, uh, and activities in economics. So Oleg, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, sorry again for the time and the jet lag. And uh, um, thank you for uh, presenting us this fantastic paper about optimal exchange rate uh, policy, co-authored with uh, Dmitry Mukhin. Mukhin. Thank you very much, Oleg. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I, yeah, I will talk about this paper with uh, Dima. It's um, the third paper in the sequence of our papers on exchange rates. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the first two uh, as a way of introduction. Uh, but this paper is specifically about the optimal exchange rate policy, and so I think it should be uh, quite suitable uh, for the Bank of Israel. Um, so basically, the question that we're after in this paper is what's the optimal exchange rate policy? And uh, what's interesting, people often talk about ex optimal exchange rate policies, but it's really uh, unclear why would you do that? Because sort of on one hand, the exchange rate is not a direct target of the policy, unless there is a goal of the fixed exchange rate, but it's unclear why the goal of a change rate should be per se, because you know exchange rate is not a variable in the objective function, right? It's not uh, consumption or leisure, so it's not output gap, it's not inflation, so we know why there are costs of inflation in the models, but it's not clear why there is a cost or benefit of a particular value of the exchange rate, right? And so that's why it's not really a target on one hand. Um, and we kind of um, have fairly robust results in the earlier literature that flows and exchange rates could be desirable because that what allows the economy to be more flexible and respond more flexibly to shocks. Yet in practice, we see something that's called fear of floating that actually a lot of countries choose not to have a floating exchange rate and instead uh, adopt some type of a, a managed peg, full peg, partial peg, a crawling peg, uh, something like that, right? And so the question then is, why there is the semen fear of floating that's been documented empirically. And on the other hand, the change rate is not a policy instrument, right? The policy instrument could be, uh, you know, effects intervention, for example, open market operation, uh, could be uh, interest rate that the central bank targets, could be some form of uh, capital control. So these are all instruments. Exchange rate is sort of an intermediate target. It's not like the final target of policy, uh, and it's not the instrument that the uh, central bank uses. It's it's an endogenous variable that could be targeted. But then the question why under which circumstances uh, would the central bank want to target specifically uh, the exchange rate? Right. So in order to address these questions, we um, uh, sort of want to start with a general equilibrium model of exchange rate that's consistent with basic properties of exchange rate. And that's been uh, pretty elusive in the literature for a long time. So in particular, there are all these famous puzzles about the exchange rate, you know, the PPP puzzle, uh, uncovered interest rate parity, Becker-Smith puzzle, the general exchange rate disconnect, uh, which some, sometimes narrowly referred as Mies and Rogoff disconnect. Um, and so moreover, there is a Musa puzzle. And so let me show you sort of in the picture of how we think about all these puzzles and sort of what it takes for a model to kind of be consistent. Uh, be consistent with all of them, right? So, um, uh, so what I plot here, and this is a picture from our previous paper, which is called Musa Puzzle Redux. So basically, this is the period of the Bretton Woods system up to 73. This was the period of fixed uh, nominal exchange rate. Uh, so most uh, developed countries in the world fixed their exchange rate against the dollar and dollar was pegged to gold. Uh, and so what I plot here is the realized real exchange rate which is just essentially, these are you know, changes of the real exchange rate, which is change in nominal exchange rate, which was zero during that period, uh, plus the inflation differential, right? And so this is literally data. Inflation is data and change in the exchange rate is data. Change in the exchange rate was literally zero here. There were two or three uh, idiosyncratic devaluations or devaluations in this period where you see the spikes, but those were standalone 
episodes of individual countries, right? And so as a result, you can see how real exchange rate was this very mildly behaving, you know, macroeconomic variable. So volatility, this is annualized volatility here, and it's the same scale here. And so basically it reflected relative inflation between countries and relative inflation is, you know, uh, one, two percent a year volatility, just like many other macro variables like output, like consumption uh, and so on. And so here there was this very discontinuous switch to a float in exchange rate. In February 73, the Bretton Woods system was uh, abandoned and the exchange rate developed countries against the dollar started to be floating. Uh, and so, yes, I have to be specific here. It's uh, seven biggest economies against the dollar. Um, uh, and we take the weighted average of those seven biggest economies, right? And so suddenly this real exchange rate between the seven biggest economies and the dollar became very, very volatile, right? I mean, nominal exchange rate became volatile and real exchange rate. And basically, again, note the uh, extent of that volatility. It's like 15% uh, annualized. So like the typical standard deviation here is about 12% annualized. And here it was one or 2%, right? So it's an order of magnitude increase in the volatility of the real exchange rate. Okay. Well, that thing might have been expected because after all, real exchange rate tracks nominal exchange rate. That's sort of the PPP puzzle, but, uh, perhaps given that real exchange rate tracks nominal exchange rate, that's something to be expected. Uh, what was surprising to a lot of economists is like, why this volatility didn't go into macro? Why didn't it go, for example, in consumption and relative consumption growth between countries? Why if there is such a massive volatility in relative international prices, there is no corresponding volatility in relative international quantities like relative consumption, but you can do it with relative output and uh, many other methods, right? And sort of in normal times during the floats, we think of this picture as exchange rate disconnect, the sense that exchange rate can be an order of magnitude more volatile than macro variables, right? And if you take the correlation between the two series, the correlation is about zero, maybe slightly negative, which is the Be Beckus-Smith puzzle, that models predict that it should be strong and positive. Uh, models predict that the order of volatility should be more similar and um, that um, the correlation should be uh, yeah, actually strongly positive, but then the data is mildly negative, right? And so this is um, uh, this is the uh, kind of the normal times. But then what we argue is that the really big puzzle is not this lack of macro volatility. So this is kind of partial equilibrium and you can kind of achieve the lack of transmission from exchange rate into quantities here by means of low pass-through. So if you build models with low pass-through of a change rate into prices and then of prices into quantities, we can possibly uh, get there. What's truly um, uh, difficult for models is to explain the lack of macro volatility here. And so why is that? Well, intuitively think about it. Imagine there is all this real volatility here. It's real because it's a real change rate, right? So there is some uh, force in the data that converts shocks into this real volatility, right? Uh, so it could be due to sticky prices, or it could be because it's real shocks that are driving this. It could be financial shocks that are driving this, right? But then in order to stabilize the exchange rate, the monetary authority uh, should, you know, like if you think like in standard trilemma models, you either choose the exchange rate or you choose monetary policy. So if you have to absorb all this volatility from exchange rate using monetary policy, right? Well, it has to go somewhere. And indeed it has to go into macro variables, right? You will be using your interest rate policy to absorb in those shocks. The interest rate policy will push the shocks into prices if prices are flexible or, in, and we didn't see an increase in volatility of inflation in that period here, or if prices are sticky, it would push it in real variables like consumption output. And you know, you see no discernible change. And this is really the Musa puzzle. So you need to build a model where a change in monetary regime changes the properties of real exchange rate, but was also consistent with mild changes uh, in the properties of real variables, right? And so once you build the model, what it will turn out, this is what we argue, is that um, a lot of the shocks in exchange rate that's here need to come from the financial market. And so here it's the UAP deviation, and there should be an endogenous shock to the UAP deviation. The thing is, if you're just trying to match this, you don't know really much about the micro foundation here, any type of shock will actually be sufficient to match the patterns here, to match the exchange rate disconnect under the flow. 
But what you really need in order to explain this part of the picture or the all four quadrangles together is that the shock itself is endogenous to monetary po uh, policy, right? And so uh, in particular, endogenous to equilibrium exchange rate, nominal exchange rate volatility, right? So this is like a real wedge. It's a wedge to um, a real financial outcome, but it's endogenous to monetary policy and in particular to exchange rate volatility. And so if you build a model like this, where switching from one exchange rate regime to another endogenously changes the amount of volatility in the financial market, you can, you can match patterns like this, right? And so I'll, I'll show, what, what I'll do the rest of the talk is build a model with this property and show you how it's consistent with this pattern. And once you have a model like that, this opens the door for the optimal exchange rate policy analysis, right? And that's exactly uh, what we want to do here. And just to summarize, I mean, this picture in kind of like one bullet point here, it would be crucial that we build a model where exchange rate plays uh, a dual role. First of all, conventionally, uh, it is important for expenditure switching in the goods market. And that's part of every uh, model of exchange rates that when exchange rates move, it allows to switch expenditure from home goods to foreign goods. Uh, and this is why we actually want the exchange rate to be moving in equilibrium uh, because it uh, helps the adjustment in the goods market, right? But at the same time, exchange rate volatility will uh, have consequences for risk sharing between countries, uh, right? And more exchange rate volatility actually will create bigger risk sharing wedges uh, between countries, right? And so once you have this trade-off between exchange rate, and this is in a way, this is a novel trade-off that we bring into uh, the analysis, it's the feature that's necessary to feed the data, but it also leads to uh, very interesting new um, optimal exchange rate policy analysis. Um, so let me see if I should take questions here. Okay, well, uh, please stop me if you have questions, especially clarifying questions, and um, I'll be happy to take them as I go along. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so this is what uh, uh, we're gonna do. I will skip the results for now and largely skip the literature. And uh, I will first develop the model and then I'll show you results one by one as they come out of the model. So what I wanna emphasize is uh, what we bring in new into this analysis is we combine in fairly standard uh, uh, new open economy uh, analysis of optimal uh, policies, right? So it's uh, the long sequence of papers um, going back uh, a long time, we bring in segmented financial markets that recently have become particularly important uh, in international macro and finance literature. And so I'm going to build a type of a model with uh, segmented financial markets, and that would be an essential ingredient. Uh, in this sense, we're going to be analyzing the financial transmission of uh, monetary policy, which is also a very active area of research right now. Um, um, the, uh, in terms of policy analysis, the closest paper to ours is the recent paper from the IMF. So Gita Gopinath with co-authors developed um, something that's called uh, integrated policy framework. And so that, um, you know, what we're doing is quite related to that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, another paper, so I'm not going to have too much time to talk about capital controls, but on capital control side, we're going to be particularly related to Fanelius Schaub also another recent paper. And in general, it's a very active um, area of work right now. And so I'll try to emphasize uh, what's new and special about our, our paper once I get there. Okay, so with this, I'm gonna uh, jump uh, into um, uh, the setup of the model, but uh, let me, uh, yeah, if there is a question, please uh, go ahead and I'll take a cup of water. Uh, Yes, so uh, here's the setup. And in fact, uh, the setup will be very simple. There would be a conventional part, which is here on this slide, and there would be a less conventional part on the bottom of the slide. So it's a um, small open economy uh, that produces trade, well, with tradables and non tradables. And sort of the second part of the model is segmented financial market, right? So household, and we're going to make very strong assumptions on this part to simplify uh, the analysis, but it turns out our previous models build much more 
sophisticated quantitative models of this part. And so we know that qualitatively what we need for the analysis is these ingredients, and it will generalize to the models with much more realistic features in this part. And so in the extension sort of since we know since we know how to do it, so our extensions can allow for all this uh, generalizations. But today I will present the, the, the bare bones, simple model of this part of the economy. And so it starts with a very simple utility. So this is uh, this log um, Cobb Douglas utility between tradables and non-tradables. Gamma is the weight in consumption basket on tradables. One minus gamma is the weight on non-tradables. And tradables is just endowment. So a country has an exogenous stochastic endowment of tradables and the price of tradable satisfies the law of one price. So basically it's the exchange rate that converts the world price of tradables into home currency. And we'll assume that the world price of tradables is stable. It's equal to one. And that's essentially like inflation stabilization in the United States, right? So the United States can stabilize inflation, an assumption that's pretty good outside of you know, rare episodes like last year. And so we can then introduce uh, shocks to foreign inflation, which is an interesting source of shocks as well. If I get there, I'll talk, talk about it. But for the main part, basically, the, the volatility of the exchange rate will direct, well, movements in exchange rate will directly contribute uh, to prices of tradables. And this is not a terrible assumption for small open economies. A big component of inflation is imported inflation, and it's imported when exchange rate, uh, when exchange rate fluctuates, right? And so that's that's that part of the economy. So now uh, this is the produced good, the non-tradable. It's produced using labor, using this uh, technology. Productivity moves around. And, uh, and another extreme assumption that we adopt here is that prices are fully sticky. And so if I will have time, I'll show you how this generalizes immediately to the situation where prices adjust. But uh, to kind of explain the mechanism more starkly, I will make this assumption where basically non-tradable prices are just fully sticky. So the monetary policy needs to accommodate this monetary stickiness and make sure, um, well, one of the goals would be that there is no output gap in the production uh, of the non-tradable good, right? Uh, more generally, monetary policy should uh, uh, be concerned with both the output gap and inflation. And this would immediately generalize the problem that I'll show you uh, very soon, right? So the budget constraint of the households, they can only borrow in the domestic currency bond. And then they consume tradables and non-tradables. They receive wages for working in the non-tradable sector. This is an equilibrium flexible wage here. We could have put stickiness here as well um, instead of the prices or in both. So that's all doable. And these are the profits that they receive from firms and transfers uh, from the government. So this part is very, very standard with the stark you know, assumptions. Um, uh, about production and low fund price. The less conventional part of the model is financial market. So basically households can buy foreign tradables um, from, the, from the foreign country. They can buy it directly. But if they want to run a trade deficit, for example, uh, they cannot directly borrow from foreign households. So this market for borrowing is unavailable. So they have to go through the financial market. Again, fairly realistic. They have to go for, to the bank to borrow in local currency. Um, the bank, if it wants to intermediate the, this trade deficit, basically lends to home households uh, in home currency and borrows from foreign currency in dollars. So it borrows from the rest of the world in dollars and um, lends to the home currency. Well, I, I call it a bank, but it, much more so it's some type of an intermediary. So basically the statement here is, very straightforward. It's generally true that if you know if you have two, two countries with trade imbalance, there's got to be also a currency imbalance somewhere, right? Uh, one of the countries has to uh, hold the exchange rate risk, and so the model spe specifies that it would be a specialized financial uh, firms, financial intermediaries, or sometimes I'll call them arbitrageurs, uh, who hold that exchange rate exposure. But somebody needs to hold that exchange rate exposure. Uh, when there is international trade. And so we specify that it, it's concentrated in the hands of the financial sector. On top of it, the financial sector needs to trade with liquidity or noise traders who prefer saving in one currency versus the other currency. And so this, this noise traders for non-macroeconomic reasons, uh, they want to hold one currency relative to the other. 
And the intermediary needs to make sure that the market clears for exchange rate. Right? And so some agents that it trades against are the households. And some agents are this liquidity traders who need one currency relative to the other. And this increases or potentially reduces the exposure of the financial sector to the exchange rate. Right? And finally, there is a government with reserves. F are the foreign currency reserves. And the, uh, the government, uh, central bank, can offer reserves to the market. So if there is, for example, demand for dollars in order to buy, um, in order to run a trade deficit for the country, well, the government can alleviate it with selling dollar reserves uh, to the market. And so alleviating the need for the arbitrageurs to uh, intermediate. And then at the, the day, the market needs to clear. So this would be the position of the intermediaries. This is the position of liquidity traders. This is the central bank. And this is the net foreign asset position, which is the, river, uh, which is the accumulated uh, trade surplus of the country, right? Uh, so this is trade surplus, and uh, you know the currency position of these three agents need to balance out the uh, trade surplus. So this is market clearing, and so I will talk a little more about the specific poly uh, problem that the arbitrageurs solve, but they uh, sort of maximize uh, a return on a portfolio that's uh, essentially a carry trade. It's long dollars or short home currency, or vice versa. This is a return on the carry trade, and they maximize the basically the portfolio, which uh, does the carry trade investment, and there is a penalty for risk of that portfolio, and Omega is like a risk aversion. And so we're going to talk a little more about it uh, in a couple of minutes. Okay. Yep, please. Yes, we just have one question about the second point. So what do you mean by uh, non-tradable, fully sticky prices? So um, can you precise? Yes, we don't see your screen. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, you have most of the economy is non-tradable goods. Well, most of the economy is some final good, right? And there is a big domestic non-tradable component uh, which needs to be produced domestically, right? And so prices of those goods adjust slowly and this means that they adjust very slowly. That That's all. What okay. it means to say, I think it does not mean so that there is no inflation. It just means that they are just they are just very this, okay. this assumption would mean that in the limit there is no inflation. But the the way to think about it is take your conventional uh, New Keynesian model where there is inflation output gap, and just take a limit as prices become more sticky. In that limit, there will be no inflation. Everything will go into output gap, and in a couple. Show you how it directly generalizes when there is both inflation output gap. So what I will do okay. uh, will be derived in this extreme assumption. So indeed, under this assumption, central bank should not care at all about inflation, only stabilize output gap, but don't take it literally, right? Think about it as a limiting case of a new Keynesian model, and everything that you know about the new Keynesian model actually generalizes to this case. Um, yeah. Uh, I'll, and and I'll, sh I'll show you exactly how it will look with the equations in a second. But this will make it easier for me to explain the new part of the model. You'll, you'll see in a second. Um, okay. So <clears throat> what I will do in order to explain how this model works, I will uh, first explain how the first best, how, you know, what the best thing that the planner can achieve uh, in this environment, how it looks like, right? I will refer to it as a constrained optimum. So the idea is, can you maximize the objective of the uh, households subject to the production function constraint for non-tradables, right? That this is how much of them you can produce and it has to equal non-tradable consumption, which will go here. And uh, sort of the intertemporal budget constraint of the country. And note here that this is a different interest rate. That's not the one space. The households face the home currency domestic interest rate uh, but this is the international interest rate and foreign currency that the country faces as a whole, right? So while households don't have access to it, the country as a whole does have access. So the central bank has access and the financial sector has access uh, to this interest rate. So from the point of view of the country as a whole, this is net export. So this is the difference of tradable endowment minus tradable consumption, so net export. And this is accumulation of net foreign assets. And this is the international relative price intertemporal at which you can do it. And so this is kind of the consumption possibility frontier of tradables for the country. And so the question is, what's the best that the country can do? Well, and the answer is with this utility, if you just maximize it subject to this constraint, the best thing to do is to always work one unit of labor 
So employment should be stable at one, full employment in this model, and output should then just fluctuate with productivity. So consumption should just fluctuate with productivity. So what the government, this ensures that there is no output gap. If consumption of non-tradables deviates from it, there is output gap. If consumption is too high, there is a positive output gap. If it's too low, it's a negative output gap. Alternatively, you can think about it in terms of wage inflation. The wage inflation should reflect productivity. If productivity goes up, wages should grow because prices are stable. If productivity goes down, uh, wages should fall with the productivity, right? And so this is the goal of the central bank to essentially stabilize wage inflation at the rate of productivity growth. So this is maybe more conventional to think about it or stabilize output gap, which will mean that. So now in terms of tradables, you just want to be on a conventional Euler equation, importantly, with the international interest rate here. So the international foreign R star is the right slope for the earlier equation for the country, right? And so you need to choose the path of consumption, of tradable consumption, uh, that, or the path of net exports if you want, such that it satisfies the budget constraint and satisfies the earlier equation. There is unique such path. Uh, it's not analytically solvable in general uh, because this is non-linear equation here, but there is always a unique solution, very easy to obtain it. Um, and so this is the characterizes the first best and I will or constrained optimum and I'll denote it with tildes, the constrained optimum. So this allows me to introduce wedges in this analysis. The first wedge is output gap conventionally, which is departure of output of non-tradables here from uh, first best level of non-tradable production. So whenever there is the departure here, it means that labor departs from one and there is an output gap in the economy. The second wedge, which is more specific to our analysis is a risk sharing wedge. It's essentially the departure of the path of tradable consumption from the path which satisfies this equation. So if this equation is not satisfied, uh, there is a wedge to risk sharing. You don't share risk in the best way with the rest of the world, given your ability to basically trade intertemporally at the international R star, right? And so you wanna close this wedge as well. You want the optimal path of international consumption of tradable consumption, which would you know ensure uh, optimal uh, risk sharing. And so what the government does is it wants to minimize uh, the loss function. It turns out the second order approximation to this welfare function is this loss function. So you minimize uh, the risk sharing wedge with the weight of the tradable goods in your utility, and you minimize the output gap uh, with the weight of non-tradable goods in your utility. And this is the log linearized budget constraint uh, so Z is exactly the deviation of net exports uh, from the optimal path, right? So the way to think about Z is the deviation of tradable consumption, but because this is exogenously given, whatever deviation is here is the deviation of this whole thing, right? And so this is the deviation of net foreign assets from the first best, and this is deviation of either, you, you can think about a trade uh, surplus and deficit or a tradable consumption from the first best. The model is so simple that, you know, there are, you know, there are this, uh, wedges that uh, are both in the objective function and the, in the budget constraint, more sophisticated versions of this model slightly change these equations. There are more parameters typically, but uh, qualitatively, the trade-off is the same. And so when you look at this problem, well, zero here is feasible. So zero here and zero here is feasible, right? So basically, with, with just this constraint, uh, it's feasible to be at the first best. There is nothing uh, there is nothing interesting yet. So you need to introduce trade-offs. And this is what I'm going to do on the next slide. So let me see if there is question about this. The next slide will introduce all the interesting uh, features for us. Well, first of all... I may have one question. Yeah, Oleg, I'm sorry. I, I may have one question about the loss function. So uh, maybe it's a stupid question, but why do you think the policymaker will uh, follow... Um, the weightings that you suggested with the gamma. Oh, no, no, it's a result. Why? It's, it's, it, it's, it's a proposition and it has a proof. If, if the policymaker wants to maximize welfare of the country, which is this, okay, then it, it's the same as minimizing this to the second order approximation. So this is a general second order approximation to this, right? And it's clear why, yes. because this is the weight you put on tradable consumption, it's gamma. And so, you know, the deviations from risk sharing create losses in welfare through this term, which has a weight of gamma, 
and the deviations from optimal allocation here create losses through this term and this has a weight of one minus gamma and well this is a log term but the second order approximation to any function is quadratic that's why you get the z squared and you don't have a linear term because you approximate it around the constrained optimum so in, in the constrained yes, yes. optimum, there are no, no first order distortions, right? And so that's why uh, the you MSK, get the shapes. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, but I'm asking this question more related on inflation. So you have no inflation, almost no inflation in your in this model. So yeah, yeah. why if would you, you maybe assume maybe that the policy maker? If, if you give me until here, I'll show you how it generalizes with okay. inflation. Okay, okay. So and this yeah. will be more, more familiar, yeah. Okay, so let me introduce a couple of features into the model, and then I'll show you how things generate. And so, uh, <clears throat> so first of all, let's look at goods market uh, equilibrium condition. So households choose the consumption of tradables and non-tradables. This is a Cobb Douglas utility within a period. So you will allocate expenditure between tradables and non-tradables according to the relative price. So this is the price of tradables. This is the price of non-tradables. And so to make it very, very stark, remember we assume that this is equal to one which we can relax, but for now we assumed, and these prices are sticky at one, so these both are ones, so the relative price is just the exchange rate. And it makes it very, very stark that in order to get the relative prices of tradables and non-tradables correctly, you need a very specific value of nominal exchange rate, right? When shocks happen, the tradables and non-tradables, there is a movement in relative price that needs to accommodate the you know, optimal uh, allocation between tradables and non-tradables, but when this price, uh, is normalized to one by foreign monetary policy, and uh, this is normalized to one by you know price stickiness domestically. The only way you can adjust prices is by movement on the exchange rate, and so you need movement on the exchange rate. So note, obviously, uh, more generally, this relative price can adjust by means of inflation here, but to the extent prices are sticky, this will happen slowly, and so this feature that uh, nominal exchange rate movements are needed uh, for the optimal expenditure switch and will be preserved even when prices are just sticky, right? As long as they're sticky to some extent, you need movements in exchange rate to accommodate uh, expenditures. This is expenditure switching essentially, right? And this is the first goal of the exchange rate is to accommodate expenditure switching in the goods market, right? And so the first magic kind of happens when we just linearize this equation. So you can divide and multiply it by the first best. And so then write it in logs. So this part in logs and this part in logs. And so this is what you're going to get. You're going to get that nominal exchange rate can be decomposed into the first best real exchange rate. What is first best real exchange rate? Well, it's this term. Remember, this was the um, a ratio of non-tradables to tradables, but in first best with the tilde. Uh, this is the ratio of first best non-tradables and tradables, and this corresponds to the first best relative price, which we call first best real exchange rate, right? So nominal exchange rate is first best real exchange rate and the two wedges that we introduced. And this is the, you know, it's beautiful, right? But, you know, how did that happen? Well, the first wedge comes from here. The second wedge comes from here. So either exchange rate is at the level of the first best prices, Q tilde, or there is a wedge here, or the wedge here, or in both places. And the two wedges are output gap and non-tradables and resharing wedge and tradables. And so this is the first important equation that nominal exchange rate needs to accommodate movements on the real exchange rate. If, and if it doesn't, then it will, it, it's got to be that there is at least one wedge that opens up, right? Okay, very good. Uh, so let me show you what will happen with sticky prices. So with sticky prices, you have to generalize it to objective like this, where now there is cost of inflation, because previously, because of stick, fully sticky prices, there couldn't have been inflation. So this looks much more familiar from, let's say, Claudia de Galli Gertler or uh, Jordi Galli's textbook. So this is a conventional wealth for loss and the New Keynesian model. Ours is just the limit when there is no inflation. This is zero, so that disappears, right? These are all the constraints that we still need to derive. Uh, this is the new Keynesian Phillips curve with possibly cost push shocks. So this is completely conventional. And so the difference would be that now the nominal exchange rate will be not just these three terms as I had, and I will have to explain where that equation came from. But uh, in my analysis, this will be the nominal exchange rate because there is no inflation. But nominal inflation and real exchange rate can be 
nominal and real exchange rate can be separated by nominal domestic inflation, right? And so this is the feature. But like why I don't need it in my basic analysis to explain you all the results? Well, you can always think about it as a two-step problem. First, you solve for the optimal path of inflation and output subject to Phillips curve. And that's what all the new Keynesian analysis taught us to do. Once you've done it, uh, you can reduce the dimensionality of the problem. Once you know the optimal path, you can express all of this as either output gap or either inflation because you figured out your lean against the wind policy uh, and so on. And you don't need that constraint anymore because you optimized this part, right? And then uh, you already fixed the path of this inflation from there. And so as a result, what will end up is exactly the problem that I will analyze, right? So you're just gonna relabel some of the things. Uh, you can call it an X hat. You can re-express it as a function of X hat and you drop this equation because you already did that step of uh, optimality subject to this constraint. And this is the problem that everybody knows how to solve. So I'm not gonna focus on it. Uh, uh, and that's why I'm focusing on the simpler problem, which doesn't have that. Okay, but what, th does it make sense? Um, okay, so I'll, I'll assume that yes, I um, think so. uh, this I, makes I, I sense. I just so have one question. Uh -huh, please. Yes, I, I just have one question is because today, you know, we, we are seeing a lot of inflation that is coming from abroad. And here we don't take care about the inflation from tradable goods. So, may, yeah, okay. Maybe you have yeah, you'll to have to that? be, yes, uh, you'll have to be uh, a, a bit patient with this. So this is going to be towards slide 15 or something like that, where we're going to introduce this. And this will introduce interesting trade-offs for the central bank. So I'll, I'll try to make sure to say a few words about it. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll need to speed up a little bit. Okay, so basically what my uh, financial sector does. So this characterizes the goods market equilibrium. And you see all the goods market will sit in this very, very simple equation. So the financial market uh, needs to intermediate. In order to intermediate, it needs to take currency risk on. So this is the size of the currency position, its exposure. Uh, you know, you can be long dollars and then short domestic currency or the other way around, short dollars, long domestic currency, depending on what the you know financial market needs. This is the return that you will generate uh, on this. This is the carry trade return. And so this is basically the solution of the portfolio wealth of the intermediary. And this is the, uh, you maximize um, the expected return using the stochastic discount factor of the households here. We just you know formulated that way with an additional penalty. If there were no additional penalty, uh, they would be just pricing the carry trade like the households would. So this is how the households would uh, do it, and so they would do it on their behalf. But on top of it, they care about the risk of their portfolio. So for example, it could be the value at risk constraint of the financial sector or some other reasons why they care about risk. And omega is the effective risk aversion. Uh, of, uh, of these guys who do intermediation. And so as a result, you get very conventional uh, portfolio choice. The size of your portfolio will be proportional to expected carry trade return, you know, discounted using the uh, relevant uh, SDF, and inversely related to the risk and risk aversion. So in order to take a position, you'll be taking it, you know, the bigger is the UIP deviation, essentially. This is the UIP deviation. The bigger is the position that you're willing to take because you're making profits. Uh, but if you have to hold a lot of risk when you take that position, then you scale down uh, your positions, right? So it's increasing in uh, expected returns, the decreasing in risk and risk aversion. And what's the risk of this position? Well, it's the risk of the carry trade strategy. And what's the carry trade strategy? Well, you pocket one interest uh, and you have to pay out data, but you have to be exposed to the exchange rate risk. So the risk of the strategy is the exchange rate risk. So this is the exchange rate risk effectively here, right? And so we can rewrite it uh, by using the earlier equation of the households for this interest rate. We can rewrite it in this form. And this is kind of cool, check it out. Remember the blue piece was the optimal risk sharing between countries. If the households uh, could choose their consumption path such that the slope of the earlier equation is R star, the world interest rate in dollars. But the households cannot directly borrow in dollars. They have to go through the financial sector and the financial sector will charge, charge them the premium. And this is the premium. And so essentially this is the risk sharing wedge, this red part, because the financial sector needs to convert 
the foreign currency into the domestic currency, so it needs to hold the currency risk. This is the size of the position that the financial sector will have to hold to clear the market. So the financial sector needs to trade against the households, against the noise traders, and against the uh, central bank, if the central bank does FX interventions. So this is the residual position of the noise traders that they need to hold. Uh, and uh, in order to hold that position, they will price a risk premium, and the risk premium is this, the whole red object is the risk premium. So it's their position times the risk that they take on times the risk aversion. So if the risk aversion is positive, the risk that they take on is positive. There is volatility of a return, so volatility of a change rate. Uh, and this is the size of the position that they take. The red piece will be the wedge, right? And so if a change rate volatility is needed here to accommodate the goods market, the exchange rate volatility here will create a, a, a risk sharing wedge, right? Essentially the risk premium that the household will need to pay in order to um, uh, in order to borrow or lend internationally. Uh, so, uh, you know, and, you know, this noise trader shock will play an important uh, role. Uh, without them, intermediation will be closer to efficient. Uh, but if a lot of the volatility comes from, um, you know, the noise trading, uh, uh, liquidity positions and currency, which need to be accommodated, that, that will create an equilibrium, more volatility uh, in this term as well. Okay, um, so the next step, what I will do is log linearize this equation, and it would be a very special log linearization, which keeps this for, this term as a first order term. Uh, so it's just we choose a different point of approximation than in the uh, standard macro approximations, which keeps uh, risk premia large, right? Which doesn't let risk premia go to zero, which keeps them. This is the risk premium, and it stays zero order uh, in the limit. The way we're going to do it as shocks become small, risk aversion becomes large, so that the product of risk aversion and volatility stays a finite number. It's not; it doesn't go to zero like in conventional macro approximations. But uh, uh, around our point of approximation, um, risk premium stay first. Risk premium stays zero order, in fact, and so uh, the total wedge stays uh, first order and affects first order dynamics of the system. And this is how it's going to look. So remember, this is tradable consumption. So deviation of this from first best, I, uh, uh, the Rishan wedge, which I call Z, and the deviation from first best is the deviation from the blue part. So the expected change in the Rishan is the red term. And that's exactly what you see here. Expected change in the Rishan wedge is the risk premium. Uh, this is the size of the position in the financial markets, and this is the product of uh, you know, risk aversion and the risk, the exchange rate risk, and exchange rate risk is just the second moment of exchange rate volatility. Um, and so now uh, we have the constraints on the planner. So the planners need to be subject to this constraint for a change rate. In normal circumstances, this just defines the value of a change rate that guarantees optimality. But once you have a change rate determined by this equation, you put it in here. Uh, typically, it will result in positive exchange rate volatility, and you will have a, uh, you know, a constraint on the dynamics of the risk share and wedge from this equation. And this is the new part of our analysis. This is what will introduce the trade-off uh, into our analysis. One thing that I want to point out here before I see if you have questions is this is from the point of view of households. This is about the slope of the earlier equation. It's about whether they do the right uh, uh, enter temporal allocation of expenditure, whether they write the right sequence of trade deficits and surpluses, right? From the point of view of households, that's this. From the point of view of the financial market, it's the UIP deviation, right? So if you think from the point of view of financial market, what is that? Well, it from the households, it's the slope of the earlier equation, but for the financial market, it's the UIP deviation, right? And it's the same thing, right? Uh, the UIP deviation and the departure from the blue equality is the discharge wedge, and it's the same. And so, basically, one way to think about it is uh, that the left hand side uh, determines the div difference between uh, interest rates and expected exchange rate deviation. And sort of the discharge wedge and the UIP wedge are one and the same, one and the same in this model. So, from the point of view of the central bank, it can look at UIP deviations as a as as a proxy for uh, departures from efficiency. Uh, in the economy. But for us, it will be easier to work in the space of wedges uh, like this, wedges X and Z. Okay, let me see if you have questions. Yeah, can I 
Ali's Please. question. So um, this construct, basically the UAP or this uh, risk sharing condition, it, it's a technical question. So since you basically solve a linear quadratic problem, the uh, coefficient omega times sigma squared is a constant, is a zero order uh, uh, variable. Yes, correct. So it's basically constant. No. So at that point, no, th th this 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 is a wrong statement. It okay. is zero order, but it's not constant. So let me give you an explanation and see whether it's sufficient. Uh, and here's indeed you are uh, misled by the conventional approach in macro, which guarantees that zero order objects are constant. Uh, but this is because uh, a conventional macro approach it blends together uh, Taylor expansion and the size of and first order equilibrium uh, and linear equilibrium system. Our case will be still first order Taylor expansion and the size of the shocks, uh, but it's not going to give us a linear system. As a result, zero order terms are not necessarily constants. They can be functions of um, uh, state variables in this economy, and that's unconventional. So in order to do this, indeed, uh, you have to do it um, you know, explicitly. So this is there will be two shocks in our model, as you will see very quickly. One is the financial shock, and one is the summary of all the macroeconomic fundamental shock. And so the standard thing is to say, well, these are the shocks, but I'm going to consider the economy as the shocks become smaller, as new goes to zero. And at the same time, I will look at this conversion as it becomes big. And so once sure. you do that, uh, you lose linearity of the system. The system becomes nonlinear. And as a result, uh, the result will be that all of these guys, all of these variables that I care about will be first order and new. That's conventional. Uh, but these things, the risk premium and the optimal policy of the central bank in terms of lean against the wind between the goods market and the financial market, as I will explain. So this will still require an explanation. This will be zero order objects. Zero order right. object doesn't mean that they're constants. They're still functions of this epsilon. Uh, sure. And they're still functions of the state variables. They're not constants, but they're zero order in new. So you have to be very careful. Uh, being zero order in new and being constant in uh, state variables of the system is no longer uh, the properties that come together. So as a result, all of this will be time variant and variant with the sequence of shocks, but it still will stay zero order in new. So this is what happens in our approximation. Fine. Okay, so technically it's, it's not like you can uh, just take a linearized model and solve it, let's say, in uh, dynamic. There's something going on in terms of the uh, solution uh, uh, procedure. It's a non, but it's so, a, it will be a nonlinear model, fine. but it will be a okay. first order Taylor expansion on the size of the shock. Yes. Sure. So, so it's linear me... quadratic, if you will, if it, it's linear quadratic and new. But in this okay. case, it does mean that it's linear quadratic in the variables that we're interested in. So, so because this whole buildup of the financial system, well, it matches very nicely the, the Musa puzzle. Uh, so, so that the friction is a function of the volatility of the exchange rate. I think Gabex and uh, Mayori basically assumed it, didn't endogenize it as in your model. They just uh, assumed it and here it's derived from, from first principles. So that's nice. But the question, my question is, so suppose let me take a simpler approach and just use, just make it a constant, literally a constant, and solve it in, in, in conventional methods. Would any of the results, well, I, I understand that there would be no, no connection or we, we can just say, uh, wave our hands and connect this uh, coefficient, this this uh, um, UIP friction to the volatility of the, of the exchange rate or the expected uh, 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 volatility. But would any of the result uh, uh, change? Would it matter the, for the policy prescriptions of the model? Well, look, if you get the same reduced form system of equations, if you get this as a budget constraint, this is a UIP wedge, uh, and this is as the equilibrium nominal exchange rate, which determines sigma, which stands here. Of course, you're going to get exactly the same answers, right? But like, yeah. why in the world would you start with this equation, right? Like the whole point was that uh, you know the properties of the model that uh, results in a model that's consistent with the data. And you want to understand what constraints it imposes on the 
oh. on the central banker, right? Of course, I, when we started, I couldn't have predicted, uh, you know, that the constraints will look like this, right? Uh, so I, I don't think it's possible. Like in retrospect, if you're willing to take this as a reduced form set of restrictions, right? That the, the country should satisfy a budget constraint, nominal exchange rate should be equal to, uh, you know, this, which is kind of conventional in models. And if you like po po postulated that this is the financial equilibrium condition, sure, you're gonna get the same answers, right? Uh, Gabek's majority is not a risk-based model and I'll show you how it's different in a picture. I'm coming sure. there soon. Um, uh, so it would be, it will disagree quite substantially on um, something. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you just, you know, plug in something here, which is a function of volatility, you're gonna probably get something very, very similar. We, of course, wanted to make sure, uh, you know, especially when you do policy analysis, right? Uh, it's impossible to just postulate reduced form relationships because you have the Lucas critique, right? And so that's exactly why we want to do it this way, because we want to figure out what's the optimal behavior of financial intermediaries uh, subject to the feature of the environment. The feature of the environment is equilibrium exchange rate volatility, which they take as given, but we want their policy function to be endogenous to that. We don't want to postulate something that, right. you know, we don't know whether it will, you know, be an equilibrium outcome or not. And so that's why all this was sort of essential to write the paper. Of course, once you have this and you believe in this framework, then your conclusions will be the same. Um, let me see how much time do I have? Thank I don't you. have all that much time, right? <laughs> you, you have very good questions and I realize that uh, we're going very slowly. How much, how many more minutes can I take? There is no problem. You can continue uh, 20 minutes, no problem. Oh, 20 minutes, then I have plenty of time. So now you know the policy problem. And so from here on, it will be very quick. We'll derive results from this, right? So the objective that we discussed, the budget constraint, financial market equilibrium condition, this is the goods market equilibrium condition that it equals the exchange rate. And so the volatility of this exchange rate uh, will affect the financial market. So this is the trade-off. These two uh, kind of things characterize the trade-off. A couple of features here. So the goods, the real macroeconomic side of the economy, all the macro shocks uh, are inside Q tilde. So you solve the model with the macro shocks. Uh, what is the first best allocation? This gives you a summary statistic, the first best real exchange rate. From the point of view of a uh, you know, policy, this is the summary statistic that you need to know. Of course, it's unobservable. Uh, but if you have a model, you can convert macro shocks into this. All the financial shocks, all the shocks in the financial markets convert into the N star. And this is the financial shock, right? And so uh, like in standard monetary analysis, you can think of this as a Phillips curve shock, and this is as an equation shock, right? It, it, it's an analogy to, uh, you know, Clary de Galli Gerthler in that way. And so we'll see that uh, the government would want to accommodate the shock, let exchange rate accommodate the shock, and eliminate the effect of these shocks on the exchange rate, right? Because that's that's how the first best looks like. The government has two instruments. It has monetary policy. And so by choosing the domestic interest rate, it can control domestic output gap. Domestic output gap and inflation more generally. But again, we agreed in this model, we'll focus on the output gap. And so by choosing uh, domestic interest rate, it chooses directly the sequence of output gaps. And so we'll think of this as a directly controlled object by the government, right? As long as satisfies this condition, there exists a monetary policy in the background that delivers that pass of um, output gap. So we'll optimize directly over X. And there is a second instrument that's FX interventions, uh, the little f. Uh, this is basically FX intervention normalized by GDP or by tradable uh, component of GDP. So it's little f. And so it, it's the second instrument. So in conventional models, what we call trilemma models, this is zero, omega is zero. And so the risk doesn't matter. And so this part is zero. And so effects interventions don't matter. So we just build a model where effects interventions matter, but also because of that financial shocks matter. And so you have one additional friction, the risk sharing friction right here, but it creates an additional instrument. So it's not a trilemma model. Effects interventions are effective uh, by swapping the portfolio of the central bank from uh, uh, from home currency into dollars versa. You change the balance, you change the composition of the balance sheet, but not the size of the balance sheet of the central bank, right? Generally, these types of things are neutral in the trilemma models, but here they are not. And the government can always offset the noise trade-in shocks. If the government offset the noise trade-in shocks, it can relax this constraint, right? Why? Because 
the need for the financial sector to intermediate. So the risk premium will be smaller. So deviations from UIP will be smaller. So the risk sharing wedge will be small, right? And so the second instrument uh, is going to be very important. And so there are two wedges. And with two instruments, typically you can accommodate two wedges fully. And indeed, this would be the first result that you just do. And let me show you the first result is, I, you know, you just, yeah, please. Uh, could I ask a clarification question, please? Please. Please. Uh, so a bit late, but um, the arbitrageurs, are they owned by domestic households or? Yes, they... so it's a very important question. And um, for now, the answer is yes. So the whole financial sector, uh, its profits and losses go into the budget constraint of um, uh, the domestic economy. So you can either think of it as being taxed away by the government, the profits and the return to the households, or you can think about uh, the arbitrageurs and the financial sector being domestic. Of course, it's very interesting to see what will happen when they're international, right? And I probably will not have time to talk much about it, but we do that uh, in an extension. Uh, most of the results that I'm telling you uh, will not change. So if you're trying to achieve the first best, all the results will be the same. But in addition, uh, when the the financial sector is international, the government has the need not to lose money to the financial sector or to make money of it, right? To use its monopoly power as a central bank to make money of the financial sector. And then there would be a trade-off whether you want to stabilize or make rents in the financial sector. If you have a third instrument, if you have capital controls, you can achieve all three. If you only have two instruments, you'll, you'll have a tension between stabilization and making money, right? So think about the US central bank, right? That can print dollars if the world demands dollars, but if it prints a little less of them, it will make a uh, monopoly rent, right? So a similar monopoly rent, in a, a lesser monopoly rent uh, is in the hands of each uh, central bank who has to deal with international noise traders, right? So noise traders want currency inelastically or pretty inelastically, and the central banks can try to take advantage of them, right? So it's super interesting to analyze it. I, I'm afraid I'm not going to have much more time to tell you about it uh, more than this, but this is in the paper. Okay, thanks, uh, but, but just yeah, to but, understand something, yeah, so yeah. The, the, the variance of the exchange rate affects their welfare or value function negatively, I think, but do you think of it as something that reduces their profits, which would then, I know, because it seems that the volatility of exchange rate uh, is, is relevant only to the degree that it affects the UAP, hmm. And I was wondering what would be the case, you know, perhaps the volatility is detrimental to the economy by its own mean. Um, so, so, so no, so here in uh, the volatility of the exchange rate, the only thing that it does is uh, really um, distort risk sharing. It distorts risk sharing only because there is a risk sharing penalty, the vol volatility penalty here. But this is the SDF of the household. So this is how the households will view the exchange rate risk. If households were holding the exchange rate risk, that's how they will price it. And this would be, you know, this would be the pricing of the UIP according to the covariance between exchange rate and consumption, which is very, very low. Even in equilibrium with very volatile exchange rate, the risk, uh, the correct risk pricing of the exchange rate from the point of view of households has a very small risk premium. So essentially, representative households uh, you know, finance suggests that representative households should not care a lot about exchange rate risk uh, because it's pretty much orthogonal to their consumption profile, to aggregate consumption. So it's it's here, it's inside the problem, uh, but essentially it's not a term that's important. The term that's important is this one, and this is the one that creates, you know, the risk sharing wedge. It's the one that gives rise to this piece. And that's the only uh, kind of significant distortion with our approximation, it's literally the only distortion that comes. Um, and so how do we think about it? Well, we think about it that these are the agents, these are the banks that they're owned by the households at the end of the day. So they, but they maximize this objective. They act on behalf of households, but there are some additional constraints on the financial sector that we model, constraints like value at risk, right? And this looks as a relevant reduced form description of the financial sector. Financial sector takes what doesn't want to take unlimited exchange rate exposure and we model it as you know in a reduced form as this risk aversion so in this sense uh, the only effect of volatility is through this term which creates the equilibrium wedge but it doesn't create other distortions because ultimately these guys it does affect their profits and uh, losses 
but they pass these profits and losses to households, and the households, for them, it's a small piece. They discount it with this discount factor, and they're fine with it, but it's really this piece that gives uh, a rise to the wedge. Uh, does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, and so what, what's important to emphasize is that all the optimal stabilization will be robust to financial sector being international. So all these results are robust. It's just that the central bank might want to have an additional objective of money making. Here, the central bank on average will not be losing money, but on average will not be making money. If financial sector is international, central bank can on average be making money, right? And so then you might want to slightly depart from this in order to make money. Okay, but now sort of the policy decouples uh, when you have both instruments. You use monetary policy to fully stabilize uh, output gap and inflation, right? If you can, you do your domestic, essentially optimal monetary policy. So you, with monetary policy, with the interest rate, you just do the domestic objective, essentially. And uh, FXI uh, targets UIP deviations. So FXI just closes the UIP deviations, make sure that this bracket is zero. So if this instrument is unconstrained, you just make sure that you make it zero. Uh, what is the target for FXI? It's not the level of exchange rate. Level of exchange rate doesn't enter the financial market at all. It's the uh, essentially the risk premium, the, the UIP deviation. It's the deviation from the household pricing of the UIP. So the central bank needs to look at the data and needs to, for like the same way uh, you evaluate output gap, it's unobservable, but you need to make a case that the output gap is there. It's easy because inflation is observable, and so we can talk about inflation being accelerating or de decelerating as a proxy for output gap. In the financial market, unfortunately, it's a harder task. You need to look and judge if the financial market results in large risk premium and try to close the risk premium up to the point that the households will you know, agree with it, right? So if from the point of view of the households, a carry trade is a good trade, uh, they like carry trade from the point of view of their SDF. The central bank is an agent on behalf of the households, and it should do that carry trade. So, uh, households cannot do the carry trade in our model, uh, but the central bank can. And essentially, by changing its, um, uh, by doing FXI, it essentially takes on a carry trade position, and it needs to do it as long as there is no UIP deviation. What it means is it it takes the job away from the financial intermediaries. It basically does the job instead of financial intermediaries, because whenever there is demand for dollars, it provides dollars. Whenever there is demand for the home currency, it uh, provides home currency and accumulate, accumulate dollars. Instead, uh, taking away the exchange rate risk from the financial sector. It's, a, it's, it's somewhat crazy because it's hard to imagine that the central bank will want to do it fully, but in order to achieve first best, that's what's needed. Uh, and I kind of can show you how equilibrium around first best look like. That, that's going to be my goal going forward, right? And so as, as I mentioned, there is no trilemma in this model uh, because you don't have this equal to zero, right? And that's why there is no one-to-one -one relationship from monetary policy uh, into exchange rate. Uh, well, because exchange rate is also determined in the financial market, right? And so there is two things that you need to know. You need to know monetary policy and you need to know financial market equilibrium to know what will happen uh, with the nominal uh, exchange rate. Why floating exchange rate is not optimal here in general without effects interventions? Well, let's let's look at that analysis. Imagine that you just target the output gap without doing effects interventions. Well, you target uh, output gap, this is zero. The nominal exchange rate is equal to this. Well, imagine this were zero, the nominal exchange rate will need to move together with Q tilde. It means that sigma will be positive. And whenever there are capital flows and positive sigma, it will create a risk sharing wedge, which, which is not zero. So it's inconsistent with the zero here. So just doing the Friedman prescription of just focusing on the domestic target and doing nothing else about exchange rate is not going to be good because exchange rate will be subject to, will be volatile. And so there would be disequilibrium condition in the financial market, which will result in endogenous volatility of the risk sharing wedge which will feed back into the volatility of the exchange rate. And so the Friedman allocation is not feasible. And this is, this is what I want you to show you in the picture. So let me show you the picture first, and this will summarize a lot of the results. I think uh, since I'm running out of time, 
I think that's the best uh, way to do it. So let me see if you had questions for that thing, and I'll show you, um, um, and I'll show you what happens uh, in the picture in a, you know, in, in the model. Okay, so the way I'm going to do the picture, I'm going to plot volatility of output gap here and volatility of nominal exchange rate here. And of course, the government wants to be here when volatility of output gap is zero. So what if you were in the trilemma model? So that this is zero, so that you don't have anything interesting in the financial market, the earlier equation or the UIP holds, like in trilemma models, you don't have the risk sharing wedge, you only have this. Right, and so as a result, you don't have the risk sharing wedge. The exchange rate is just that. Well, the answer is if you set it's feasible to set output gap to zero, then exchange rate will just accommodate the first best real exchange rate. So this is the volatility of the first best real exchange rate, and it turns out that this is what Friedman prescribes. He says, be in this point, stabilize domestic objective, and let exchange rate accommodate the first best relative price. It will happen. You know, in a in a trilemma model where this is zero, this will happen automatically. Just focus on inflation output gap, and you know the equilibrium will put you in this point. And this is the first best. This is the place where you minimize uh, uh, the loss function as a central bank. Of course, you can choose any point along this line. You can choose to use your output gap to absorb the volatility of the first best real exchange rate. Right? You can distort. Uh, domestic allocations to reduce the exchange rate volatility. And you can go to this point. This is the peg where you created output gap volatility, also inflation volatility more generally, uh, but you stabilize the exchange rate. But why would you want to be here if this point is feasible? This point is feasible, but this point is good and this point has a lot of welfare losses, right? And so Friedman's argument in 1958 was just do the domestic targeting with monetary policy and forget about the exchange rate, right? It will, it will be just fine. And this trilemma constraint, you see it's very linear, right? Because you can always use output gap to absorb the exchange rate volatility into it in a linear way, right? Okay, and so the trilemma models are characterized by this constraint. So there is a divine coincidence, which is important. It's the case when the first best real exchange rate, it's a generalization of the closed economy divine coincidence. You need all that plus that the first best real exchange rate is not volatile, that you just happen to be in an environment where the, first, the real exchange rate does not need to move to accommodate the first best allocation. Then all of this triangle will collapse into the dot at the origin. And then it doesn't matter whether you do a peg or a, uh, whether you do a peg or a float, but doing the exchange rate peg is actually guarantees that you will get into this point, right? And so this is when the pegs are optimal and have no trade-off, in the case of divine coincidence, why Q tilde doesn't have volatility. Well, it's hard to believe that the first best real exchange rate does not have any volatility at all. So this is just like a theoretical possibility. Uh, more generally, we think of it as a triangle where this point is desirable. So what happens in our model? In our model, this point is not feasible. The peg is still feasible. Why? Because under the full peg, sigma is equal to zero. So under full peg, the model looks just like when Omega is equal to zero. So it will agree on the peg uh, with the trilemma models, right? But the peg is not optimal. The problem is if you depart from the peg, you don't get here. You have an endogenous amplification of financial volatility. So why is that? Well, think you depart from the peg a little bit. Well, you open the door for exchange rate volatility. As soon as you open the door for exchange rate volatility, this is positive. And so it's sensitive to the shocks. When this is zero, it's not sensitive to financial shock. When this is positive, it becomes sensitive to, well, what is this shocks? These are you know, uh, financial positions that are taken in the financial market. Uh, if the shocks you know, move around every day, this will create an additional volatility in Z. But additional volatility in Z shows up here. So it creates additional volatility in the exchange rate. Now, it's not just the Q tilde that creates volatility in exchange rate. It's all the financial stuff that comes through Z, through Z that creates volatility in exchange rate. And you get this volatility amplification. So as a result, the further you move from the peg, the bigger you open the door to financial volatility, the bigger is this component. And in the end of the day, you end up in this point. This is the float, where all this red part is the non-fundamental financial volatility of the exchange rate. The volatility you really want to get rid of, and only this component, is the fundamental, the good volatility, right? So you can do the float, this will guarantee zero output gap, 
but you will introduce all this volatility into the exchange rate and you will create the recurrent friction, right? So now what does the optimal policy do? Well, the optimal policy, it can try to use FXI to lean against the financial volatility. And then what you do, you close the red region. You reduce the you know, equilibrium volatility here by FXI and you close the red region and you eventually in the limit, you make the F point efficient, the optimal policy I showed you that you basically use a, a monetary policy to guarantee zero output gap. And then you use the FX intervention to collapse the red region to this Friedman uh, point, right? If your FX interventions are limited and you cannot do it, the only thing that's left, imagine that this is the residual trade-off that's left, right? You, do, you did as much FXI you, as you could, and you still have the residual financial shocks to be accommodated. Then monetary policy can choose a location on this curve, on this frontier. And the loss function is like spherical, uh, the, 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 the ISA curves of the loss function uh, circles around the blue dot, which, and so then there is a circle that will touch this point, and this would be the optimal monetary policy, the optimal trade-off. And so in the remaining time, I will talk about the optimal monetary policy. Uh, but one last thing that, especially since there were questions, how we differ from all the other models in the literature. Well, all the other models look like this. Th these are the models that have exogenous financial shocks. So uh, Gabex majority will be a model like that. Uh, Gopinat and co-authors will be a model like that. Uh, and most models written in the literature um, uh, will have that feature. The feature is that these financial shocks, they're present whether you peg or float. There is financial volatility always. Uh, it just doesn't go away endogenously. And so as a result, if you calibrate the extent of financial volatility correctly to the float, those models will agree with our model on the float. But they will still have this linear trade-off like three lemma models. And what it means is that if you try in those models to do a peg or a partial peg, you're going to have a huge amount of volatility in the output gap. And this is the Musa puzzle. So all those models, they feature the Musa puzzle is that, remember, like we were talking, if you try to absorb the exchange rate volatility in a conventional macroeconomic model, including model with financial shocks, with financial frictions, right? Typically, you would need to absorb all the volatility from exchange rate into inflation output gap. And this is just not what we observe in the data. In the data, you can go to a full peg without, you know, transferring all of this inefficient volatility in exchange rate into macroeconomic quantities. You, the peg is inefficient because you have volatility in output gap, but you don't have that crazy, you know, 10% a year volatility in macroeconomic aggregates like we see uh, in the exchange rate here. Uh, a question? Right. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm about this uh, non-equivalence between these uh, other models, or at least the implications for policy, I don't fully understand. The, the way, I, or I'm probably missing something, and uh, let me think ab about it very technically. Where do we see in the model the financial shock and the uh, foreign exchange interventions? So one place is this, uh, just the UIP uh, friction. So let's say, um, FXI is just completely upset uh, uh, the financial shock. The other place it shows up, it should be in the bonds of payment equation. Well, you you make all the substitution, so it's kind of go away. We don't see it, but essentially in the beginning, I think in the very first, well, I'm not sure. Uh, in the bonds of payment, if you think about it, uh, what it has, it's like the uh, change in net foreign assets. Um, against uh, uh, basically um, uh, net exports. And the change in net foreign assets, assets in, in that component, we will also have N star and F star. So these are the only, unless I'm missing something, these are the only yeah, no, places. Not, not, not exactly. Let me clarify a couple okay. of things. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let me say one thing before and then answer your question. So, so first thing that I want to emphasize is so our model, for example, will agree with Gabex majority and with uh, uh, Gita and co-authors that this is first best, that you want to be here, and that the FX interventions will be able to close this gap. So right. we agree on this point and how to get there. You do monetary policy to get here, and you do FX intervention to close all this region. Where we disagree is whether it's possible with a managed or partial peg to offset some of the volatility in exchange rate. And their model, partial pegs will go along this line and will be crazy. In our model, they will go along this line and will lead to something uh, that's meaningful. 
what so that, then, that, then, then just that explains case. why partial uh, pegs actually would be generically desirable in our model, where partial pegs in this alternative frameworks will uh, not exactly be desirable. Okay, yes. So, so just a clarification uh, question for what mm -hmm. do you mean by uh, a partial peg? Because the way I would think about, at least when we solve the models, like uh, of FXI, it is just a state contingent interventions. I wouldn't call absolutely. that. Uh, do, do you call that? Do, do you, by yes, you say, by, absolutely. It's it, it, partial peg. No, when I say partial uh, peg, it would be with the monetary tool. It's a state contingent intervention with a monetary tool to stabilize okay. exchange rate. The okay. first best yeah. would be doing state contingent intervention with FXI. If you cannot do it, if your FXI are limited, okay, got it. Whether, whether because it's a non-negativity constraint or value right. at risk on the central bank or the limits on the balance sure. sheet of the central bank, then you cannot fully close this bracket with FXI, sure, sure. and you will do okay. state contingent monetary intervention, and that's ah. what I will call a managed. Uh, peg or managed float. And I will, uh, I, this would be my last result that I will characterize on the next slide how the partial peg managed play, peg looks in this model. And this is very, you know, specific to our uh, framework that sure, something so, that you so, don't get in, in other frameworks. So now, answering your question with which you started, um, it's not about net foreign assets. Net foreign assets is a net position, uh, this is about gross currency position. This is about who care, carries the exchange rate exposure, right? Uh, because at the end of the day, the same net foreign asset position uh, could be consistent with different agents in the economy holding the exchange rate risk. It could be uh, the intermediaries, it could be the central bank, um, uh, you know, it could be some, somewhere in between, it could be the foreign agents, right? And what you care about is that uh, there is not too much of a UIP deviation which is priced by the agent that holds the marginal currency exposure in the economy. If there is a lot of UIP deviation uh, that requires the marginal agent to hold the gross position, the gross exposure to exchange rate, then the central bank needs to step in, right? And take away that exposure at least a little bit and put it on its own balance sheet. But it's not the net balance sheet, it's the gross balance sheet that matters. Sure. So it's not about uh, net foreign assets. Yeah, um, you, you, you're right about it. You're, you're, uh, absolutely, yeah, you're right about that. I, I, I think what I, I was missing just putting it in in terms of my initial uh, uh, question, which I think technically was was correct about the UAP and the bounce of payment. What you're saying, look, there's another uh, uh, equation which I missed, which is the constraint on on uh, F star, and this is exactly the point where F star and N star don't show up together in the model, and that's why we have perfect. this. Uh, perfect. Perfect. Um, that's that's where I'm going. So there are okay. a couple of constraints Thank on you. this economy. There is an intertemporal budget constraint, which I'm not showing you, but it's always satisfied. And this is about net foreign assets of the economy. Uh, financial equilibrium condition, and if the central bank's balance sheet is unconstrained, then you can do whatever you want. But what we're gonna do next is think about constraints like this. This is like a size of the balance sheet constraint of the central bank. This is non-negativity constraint on FXI. So we do quite a bit more in the paper about thinking how to relax those constraints. But for now, what I will do is I will say, I want to show you a couple of results. So divine coincidence we discussed, this is when fully fixed exchange rate will be the first best uh, because there is no volatility in the first best real exchange rate. Um, I'm going to skip this. Yes. Yeah. I yes, Oleg, oh, we, we, right. we just have uh, two, three minutes, but uh, if you want two, to take five minutes, minutes okay, but. Uh, sure. I will I will uh, show you the last result and I I mean but you guys had very good questions so uh, that's why that's why uh, uh, so, so here's the optimal monetary policy so imagine that you maxed out of on what you can do with the FXI so if you happen to do it fully and this is zero that's great then you just stabilize the output gap but imagine you maxed out on what you can do and the financial flows are still on zero. Then here's the prescription of what you should do. At time t, you look at the UIP deviation, the Lagrange multiplier on the UIP deviation. So uh, if UIP deviations are large, Lagrange multiplier is large. It's not yet enough. So you need that there is a large UIP deviation. You need that there is a large capital flow that needs to be accommodated, and it's the product of the two. And so th the product of the two will always be positive. But the question is, how big is the product of UIP deviation and the capital flow that needs to be accommodated, right? And so if this is big, this is when the government needs to promise to implement a partial peg next period. 
say that it will use, it will compromise output gap tomorrow to lean against the wind of exchange rate surprises. Expected exchange rate movements are, are fine. If, if the financial market, everybody expects, so it's like a crawling band if you want, right? If you expect a certain movement of exchange rate, that's fine, but you want to eliminate surprises. And so what you promise the financial market essentially is that you're gonna eliminate surprises in exchange rate tomorrow to make intermediation uh, less risky so that the premium on intermediation is smaller in equilibrium so that you can relax the Lagrange multiplier on the UIP condition given the financial flow. So know that this requires commitment. You have to promise a T that you will smooth out exchange rates tomorrow. So if you don't have commitment, this is not feasible. The market will not believe you and will, you will end up with just making X equal to zero and exchange rate volatility like in equilibrium. But if you have commitment to a monetary policy rule, which internalizes the exchange rate, which partially stabilizes the exchange rate, and the financial market believes you, so it's a peg or a partial peg that is credible, then it will help you to reduce the Lagrange multipliers in the financial market, and it will stabilize it. So when will you do it more? Well, you will do it when you're a more open economy. If you're a very closed economy, if gamma is close to zero, well, you don't care about the uh, financial flows, right, as much, and you just focus on the domestic economy. But if you're a very open economy, if gamma is large, if financial flows are large, and if the UIP deviations are large, then you do it. So, 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 so it's not enough that, you know, you open and there are big financial flows. You only do it in periods of large risk premium uh, in order to uh, stabilize risk premium. And that's why this is a highly nonlinear rule. It's a state contingent nonlinear rule. Uh, you know, if we linearize the model conventionally, that would be just a constant typically, and oftentimes it would be a zero. But the way we linearize the model, you get this nonlinear interaction, right? And so you get the state contingent uh, partial pegs essentially, right? And so this looks a lot uh, how crawling pegs look, right? In, in, in periods of uh, financial volatility, um, central banks oftentimes stabilize the economy by uh, sticking to uh, some type of a partial peg or crawling bend or something like that. And in a period when there is no financial volatility, this is not uh, necessary anymore. And you just let exchange rate adjust and stabilize output. Yeah, there is one interesting question is, could you do the, if there is a bad financial conditions today, could you do monetary policy today? So the R model says, no, you have to promise something about tomorrow. So the only thing that you can do today is a fax intervention or a promise about stability tomorrow. You cannot stop the capital flight with hiking today's interest rate. The only thing you will do, you will create an output gap today, but the capital flight today will not stop because capital flight is about conditions tomorrow, right? It's about what the returns will be on the strategy tomorrow. And you need to promise no uh, volatility tomorrow or accommodate the capital flows with FX interventions, right? So that's, that's what our model suggests. I showed you the picture, you know, we talked about a little bit, well, there is forward guidance with effects, which I'm not going to show you. So this is the part when you have the potentially transfers abroad, if the financial sector is international. But one thing that I want to point out, which is very important, the policy that I showed you is always feasible because the government always trades in the same direction with arbitrageurs. So it never loses money. Arbitrageurs make money on average and the government makes money on average. And so whatever I showed you would be still feasible if the financial sector was foreign. But if financial foreign sector is foreign, potentially you can also make some money as a central bank, right? And so we describe it in the paper. And lastly, the last part, we can endogenize what is the R star. So for this analysis, we took R star as given, but in the world economy, if there is a global demand for dollar, not just a local capital outflow, but a global demand for dollar, then the R star becomes endogenous. And so it's very interesting to think what's the optimal policy cooperatively between countries when they know that R star is endogenous to their policy. You know, you can think about swap lines in this model. So in fact, instead of FXI interventions, the swap lines can work because it's all about who holds the risk. So to the extent swap lines relocate risk, who holds the exchange rate is the swap lines are very effective. And finally, if you introduce international inflation, what you asked me, well, you create an additional source of volatility here. It's not just the real exchange rate volatility now, it's also the foreign inflation volatility. And now the trade-off gets worse. If there is dollar, dollar uh, inflation volatility, the trade-off for central bank is worse. It either needs to import the dollar inflation or compromise the risk sharing, right? So the trade-off now is about not just, you know, 
uh, what you need to make a goods market efficient, you also need to import a part of the foreign inflation. Uh, we'll have extra exchange rate volatility, which is bad for the, uh, for the financial market. And so the trade-off is worse when you have this term. So this is something else that we characterize in the paper. I have to stop here, but um, I think I covered pretty much everything. So our goal here was to derive a you know, fairly realistic framework, realistic in the sense that it's consistent with exchange rate models, with the Musa puzzle and other exchange rate puzzles, that it's tractable so we can discuss you know, a fairly simple policy problem and that we can revisit a lot of the issues about optimal exchange rate policy in the context of this new uh, framework. I think, where should we go next? It's kind of obvious that the really big uh, part of the analysis is to learn to measure UIP deviations. So central banks need to know what are the risk premia in real time. So central banks are good at evaluating output gaps, which are unobservable, but like measuring UIP is a challenge and sort of an important input into this policy is kind of knowing when the UIP deviations are particularly big and when they're not big. And so there is a lot of exciting work uh, now trying to do that. So let me stop and see if you have uh, more questions for me. Thank you very much, uh, Oleg, for this very rich presentation, very rich. Um, if we have uh, one or two questions, if we can take one or two questions, uh, please raise your hand. Yes, so you see, you can start. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, OK, I'll, um, you didn't cover it in the first uh, great paper, and like, I think this is the third uh, uh, paper in a series, which are like really, really, really nice papers. Um, so one question about something you didn't really cover about optimal uh, foreign exchange interventions. Basically, in the paper, you saying you, you you shut down monetary policy. You 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 try to um, um, solve for policy for. FX intervention without monetary policy. So uh, here, I, well, again, I, I, I'm, I'm familiar with the standard New Keynesian model. And in the standard New Keynesian model, this means there's indeterminacy. We cannot hold the interest rate fixed, right, in the, in the standard New Keynesian model. So what's going on here? Um, uh, OK, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure I fully understand. Well, th thanks so much, first of all. But um, there is no indeterminacy here. There is a, in the first best, there is a separation of two policies. You do monetary policy like you would do in closed economy. You do FX uh, to eliminate uh, UIP deviations, right? But right. everything you know from the new Keynesian literature, how to do monetary policy applies. You need to adopt a Taylor rule. The Taylor rule should satisfy Taylor principle. You know, more generally, you need to think about, you know, fiscal uh, policy as well, so active monetary, passive fiscal, or the other way around. So everything you know about monetary policy from closed economy will apply here. The only thing we're saying is that there is a, a decoupling. Monetary policy affects right. domestic targets, yeah. affects interventions, affects international targets. Uh, the other two results that we have is that effects cannot substitute for monetary policy. You cannot use effects to target output gap. It just doesn't work. That's one result that I right. didn't mention, but but effects doesn't substitute for monetary. Monetary policy can partially substitute for effects interventions. When your effects interventions are limited, monetary policy can compromise the domestic objective and partially stabilize the exchange rate to eliminate risk premium. And you need commitment for that. These are the three results that I have. In every case, everything is fully determinant because you have a Taylor principle that's satisfied in the background. The only thing that I'm saying I can do it exactly in the space of output gap. I don't need to give you the policy rule to do it. And then we know how to implement it using a Taylor rule with a um, you know, Taylor principle in it, which kills indeterminacy. I, I'm not sure if I answered the question that you had, but. True. Maybe I just misread or misunderstood the, uh, what was uh, in the paper. Um, it, well, I, I'm looking in uh, the paper section 4.4. .4, consider next opposite situation when monetary policy is constrained, and the planner can only choose FX interventions. So, right. So monetary so policy is constrained, constrained you at, at, at zero lower bound, for example. Once you're at zero right. lower bound, there is no indeterminacy. You are at zero lower bound. Okay. 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 Got it. Got it. No, so, what so what I, it means that monetary policy is constrained is that you hit a corner and you cannot escape it. And so Fine. then there is okay. no indeterminacy, you at the corner. And so that's what we were saying, that the fact that you have FXI will not relax your zero lower bound problem. Sure. If it's a zero okay. lower bound, it's a zero lower bound. That's it. 
Right. Uh, okay. Got, got it. Uh, well, I have uh, maybe I'll let uh, some other people ask questions, and uh, if there's time, uh, I'll be happy to ask another one. For yes. sure, I can. So, do we have uh, any additional questions? I think you have to keep in touch together <laughs> because uh, you have a very shared, uh, a lot of shared interest in uh, in terms of research questions. So, uh, do we have any additional questions? Because we have to close now the seminar. It's one hour and a half. So that's why it was so rich, but so interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Oleg, for uh, your presentation and uh, your findings. And uh, it was very interesting. And thank you so much for investing so much time in uh, replying to, to the questions. Oh, no, thank you so much. Great questions. I really enjoyed it. I think uh, it was a very interesting discussion. Thank you.